Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles talk show that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly podcast in which we talk about all things Beatles, any part of their past, their present, basically any topic is up for grabs here on this show. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the regular co-hosts of this program, also known for my other Beatles program, a syndicated show called Every Little Thing. Being joined by two of my regular co-hosts, Sal Sussman couldn't make it for the show this time out, but he will be joining us in our next program. So with me on the program this time is the man who writes for Beatles Examiner and many Examiner columns, that being Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. And our musicologist and freelance writer, uh, also a writer for Beatle fan, as is Al Sussman, that being Alan Cosen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ken. Hey, Steve. And hello, everyone. This time out, uh, we're going to talk about the Beatles live at the Star Club tapes. And um, it's a very interesting topic to bring up because um, I really love to listen to these recordings now. I know when they first came out, there was a big controversy around them because the sound quality isn't that great. And the Beatles tried to prevent it from coming out. I thought we'd talk a little bit about the history of these recordings and um, and also talk about the music itself, the recordings, what we all think about it. And first of all, I want to just ask the two of you, when was the first time we ever heard about these recordings? When did that come to light publicly? Do you either of you know? I think probably the first time was at a Beatle Fest in hmm, the mid-70s, mid to early 70s. Uh, Alan Williams was traveling around with a tape of excerpts and was giving um, sort of talks about these recordings and playing tantalizing samples, uh, one of which, I think a recording from part of his talk uh, of a bit of um, My Girl is Red Hot, I think, turned up on a Melvin bootleg. Uh, And... Others turned up when someone apparently got their hands on Alan Williams' excerpt tape and put that out. Um, But we didn't really hear – most people probably didn't hear about them until 1977 when they were um, semi-officially released on a couple of labels, Bellafon in Germany and Lingasong in the U.S. um, as a a two-album set, two-LP set. Yeah, I remember hearing that at Joe Pope's Beatle convention. Mm-hmm. It was either in 73 or 74. That's when Alan Williams brought the tapes over. And they were played directly from the reel-to-reel. Mm-hmm. And it, sh- it should be mentioned that uh, those two albums were different. They weren't the same. They had different tracks on them. Um, mm-hmm. It seems to me, I believe um, one of the differences was uh, Where Have You Been All My Life. I think that was on one and not the other. But your point about uh, My Girl is Red Hot, Alan, I remember hearing that first on that um, that weekly, that uh, news show, and I can't remember the name of it now, that, that did little minute, minute excerpts. You know the, the one Days I'm talking? in the Lives? No, no, no. This was a uh, – in fact, I, I, the entire series has, has circulated, and I remember hearing Red, Red Hot there first. Uh-huh. Um, and it was only a, it was only like ten or fifteen seconds um, of it because uh, and that's all you heard. And um, but I, I could be wrong. You might have the time right on that. But I remember hearing about it. I don't remember exactly how. I didn't hear it at a Beatle convention, but I remember you know the scuttlebutt. Maybe the, there might have actually been news reports about it at the time. Uh-huh. And um, and I remember. You know, looking for them. I remember, you know, walking through a shopping center in San Jose, looking for the different versions, and I found them. Mm-hmm. And uh, I didn't particularly care for them at the beginning because the sound quality was so bad. It's only later that that I really came to appreciate them more. Um, and I think they're, I think they're really fantastic. And it's and not to skip a, too far ahead, but it's curious to me how they don't embrace this, and they did embrace those. Um, Quarryman tapes on the anthology. That's strange because those anthology tapes, uh, those tapes on the anthology are, 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 d- are really dreadful. I mean, they're, <laughs> I think they're worse. They're, if, they, if you think the Star Club tapes are bad, these are much worse. 
you know. But I I, and I like the Star Club tape, Club tapes and you know what people have done with them. Uh, we can go through some of the history of that, but um, you know, there's been some there's been some nice upgrades. I, I don't understand why they uh, they didn't uh, you know take more kindly to them. Maybe they weren't get because they weren't getting any money off of them, or I mean, you know. Well, they could have, of course. They they could have. Right. Uh, Alan Williams offered to sell them the tape in 1973, and uh, and they could have had it in their vaults and done what they wanted with it. I, I think it's an emotional issue, really. You know, those early tapes that were on the anthology from the, the, the they weren't really the quarrymen. They were they were actually practicing pre Hamburg, I think, in the spring of '60, but. But I think it's kind of clear that those are uh, an unpolished young band practicing, whereas these um, are the Hamburg tapes where, you know, they were already the Beatles as we know them pretty much. They had already right. recorded Love Me Do, and I guess they wanted them to be at a higher standard than they felt they were. Whereas the practice tapes are just practice tapes, and they only gave us a few minutes of them. Mm -hmm. um, the Hamburg tapes that they stopped in court uh, were, you know, was really a double album set that purported to show them playing as they would normally in Hamburg. And I say purported because it doesn't, it doesn't. You know, should I, should I elaborate? Sure. You're gonna, I wish you would. I mean, we 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 know they've been jerked around. You know, uh, yeah. I mean, there've been there've been bootleg releases, but even more recently, you know, there 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 have been other things that have gone on. Go ahead and talk about that. Okay, so you know, the raw tape was recorded over a few nights while they were playing um, at the end of 1962, and it captures them as a bar band, which is fundamentally what they were. You don't get a lot of applause between songs and you don't, you know, it's not polished and there's a lot of chat in between the songs, some of which is, um, you know, fairly rude and some of it is funny. Some of it is sort of a bit of banter between them on stage or between them and someone in the audience. And it's very loose, but the sound isn't really that bad. Mm. Uh, what what happened in between those tapes and what we heard in 1977 is someone acquired the tape from Alan Williams and an engineer named Larry Grossberg made detailed notes about what was on the tape and did what I believe was really a well-intentioned attempt to make the tape sound better. How did he do that? Well, he actually wrote a, a, a piece in High Fidelity magazine describing what he did. And basically, he took this mono tape and he put it onto a multi-track tape doing different EQs for each track so that he could, he hoped, bring out the guitar, bring out the bass, you know, bring out each channel. He would try and bring out something else. And then he attempted to make a mix. In addition, I guess he felt that, you know, if this is supposed to be a Beatles live tape, we can't have a lot of this dead air in between the songs. We have to have applause and we have to have, you know, not necessarily screaming in the 1964 Hollywood Bowl sense, but we have to have some audience reaction, you know, and there was some in some parts of the tape and he used that and I don't know if he enhanced it in other ways, but he sort of added that between all the songs and that in, in a certain way kind of falsifies the experience of the tape because when you listen to the raw tape, it, it's not there. Mm -hmm. um, he also edited out a lot of the comments and talking and, and things. He left in enough to capture the flavor, I think, but, but a lot of that's gone. Uh, false starts are gone. I think there are some performances that are edited, you know, bum notes taken out, things like that. And he put this out as an album. And the, the problem is that that whole EQ thing, while theoretically not necessarily a bad idea, in practice it just made the tape sound a lot muddier. 
than the mm-hmm. original tape. Now, the original mm-hmm. tape has made its way out in various forms over the years, especially recently. There, uh, maybe an hour or a little more than an hour has come to light that um, I believe was probably taken from a tape that goes back to 1973 that had been copied for Apple. How that got out, uh, I can't really say, but it's the purest version of this recording that we have. Mm -hmm. Um, And I kind of wonder, since Apple had custody of this tape or a copy of it, whether when George Harrison went to court in, I think it was, what, 92 was it um, to – pro- was it in 1977? <laughs> uh, yeah, they actually sued twice. Um, they first sued in 1977, and they did not prevail, because partly because the judge seems to have misinterpreted a comment that Neil Aspinall made um, about John Lennon telling Williams uh, or Ted Taylor that he could do what he wanted with the tape. Um, uh, Aspinall was actually saying this should not be construed as permission to put the tape out. Um, the judge heard it differently and, and felt that, okay, if John gave Taylor permission to do what he wanted with the tape, then there's no case here. So Apple lost the first case. Um, they then went back in 1998, it was, when um, Sony put out its two individual CDs of the Star Club material. And since Sony is a much bigger target, I guess, than Lingasong um, or, or, or the, you know, Bellafon and the, the other small labels that have put it out until then, I guess they felt it was worth their while to revisit the subject. So they went to court and they brought out more big guns, including George Harrison, who in his testimony said something to the effect of, you know, one one drunk recording a bunch of another drunks doesn't make a recording session. I'm looking at your story right now, Alan, and the exact quote says, "One drunken person recording a bunch another bunch of drunks does not constitute a business deal." Right. So, there, um, there you so would you say my story is this? You were saying that something of mine that I wrote in 1989 was quoted someplace. Is that what you're? I, I uh, something. I'm looking at that. It's 1998. No, it's 1998. Uh, uh, right. You posted this on Rec Music Beatles. I see. Okay. Many so, years ago. Many, mm-hmm. many years ago. Would you agree? Uh, I, I recently, and I didn't unfortunately get to write this up, Ted, Ted, there was the recent auction of the quote, quote, master tapes. Right. And Ted, Taylor, Ted Taylor said that they were not the master tapes. Um, it, it actually was always advertised as a safety copy, not as the original. Um, it was Larry Grossberg, actually, who was auctioning the tape, and it was his pre-EQ copy that he was selling. And I have to say I, I'm a little surprised that it didn't sell, although I think maybe they expected too much money for it because that is the version of the tape that you want you know it's it, it's the purest version it also establishes what the actual running order of the songs was which is something nobody has yet figured out um we may find out soon actually because um uh, Hans Olaf Gottfredson who has written a lot about the Hamburg era uh, he's written mm-hmm. a, a large book about it i think um what was it called from the Cavern to the Star Club, or I can't remember. Right. It's, uh, it's right behind me. But he's um, interviewed Larry Grossberg, and Larry Grossberg sent him a copy of his notes from the tape box uh, yeah. all those years ago. And I believe he has a, an article coming out in Record Collector this month or next month uh, in which he discusses what was on Grossberg's notes. I don't think he got to listen to the tape. Um, but Grossberg's notes should establish the actual running order. And um, Hans Olaf told me that um, so far, everybody who has tried to reconstruct the original running order on bootlegs or in books, including himself, had it wrong. So uh, that will be an interesting, interesting article to see, I think. Oh, yeah, mm. absolutely. Absolutely. Now, there's a, there's a new uh, package of these recordings that just came out. But um, there was an adjustment made to the sound quality. Um, right. Uh, this is this is a package called Zulout, and 
there were a few things done. Um, the, the person who compiled it, who is a very fastidious sound guy, um, first of all, went out of his way to get the best possible sources, meaning not using the Lingasong versions, the, the versions that Grossberg prepared for release um, wherever possible, but using that hour-long tape um, that I mentioned a few minutes ago, um, using, I believe he had a tape source for the uh, Beatles versus the Third Reich, which was uh, one of the albums made from Williams's tapes uh, back when he was lecturing on them hmm. um, and uh, and some other things. And the other thing he did is, I mean, he's he didn't want to overdo it on the EQ, but he experimented with a stereo expander, a plug-in of some kind. I'm not sure who makes it or which one. And he had done it originally just as an experiment because that kind of thing gets pretty widely criticized when it's done. Um, but what he found was that doing that actually seemed to bring out certain of the instruments more clearly than just the straight mono tape. And so when he decided to put this package out um, as a free fan production, it's not a, a, a for sale bootleg, um, and he released it various places on the internet, um, he decided to use the stereo, the the mock stereo version. And I have to say, it doesn't sound bad. It, we're not talking about Dave Dexterized, you know, fake stereo with a millisecond delay between channels and lots of reverb. Um, it actually sounds, uh, sounds really good. And I think I, I hear what he means about hearing some of the rhythm guitar texture and things like that. I think you have to say, at least in my thing, feeling is that Overall, though, it doesn't. It's not a a huge improvement over what you already know for the sound quality of that set. Would you agree? I mean, it does. It may improve some of the instruments, but it doesn't improve the tape itself. Well, right. I mean, it's still a an amateur recording, right, from a single suspended mic in a club in Hamburg while people are talking and drinking, and you know, and the Beatles are playing. That's true, but it doesn't have all of those um, EQ problems that the Linga Song version had, and it also presents the tape as much as possible the way it exists in its raw form. There's lots of um, talking and dead air in between the songs, and it, it gives, I think, a much more realistic idea of what that experience might have been like, you know, just right. hearing them in that, in that situation. There's also a lot of – I was listening to it this afternoon. There's some new uh, bits and chatter in there that have not been heard before. So there's yeah, some, quite some, a lot. Yeah, or, yeah there's mm. stuff that you haven't heard. We had mentioned that we kind of skipped over the Ox Tango release, mm -hmm. um, and I thought that was really good. You know, as far as improving the, the overall sound quality, I thought – the Ox Tango package did a great job. Uh, unfortunately, it appears that that's not going to be something that you can get anymore mm -hmm. unless you get a copy of it from somebody who already has it. Um, right. The, the last couple times I've checked the website, you know, they still have the, the notices that they're still trying to get things together. And that's, you know, you can, you can take that for what it is because, because, uh, you know, the Beatles have apparently gone after them. So, Right. Um, yeah, but I mean, I thought Ox Tango did a great job with that with those tapes. I really did. Did you? Do you guys agree as far as that goes? What I heard from Ox Tango sounded brighter and punchier, mm -hmm. um, especially Red Hot, that one in particular. I do like the new one that came out. It has it's a different sound. It it sounds kind of fatter and mm -hmm. wider. But then again, you also have to you have to question how much can you do with a mono recording. I mean, the, right. the main problem that anyone can have with this recording, and it's not a problem for me anymore, because you have to realize what it is. This sounds like if you were in the back of the Star Club, this is what the band sounded like. Um, mm -hmm. The mix itself, you hear the guitars really well. You can hear the drumming pretty well. The only thing that you have a problem with are the vocals. You can hear them, but they're more distant. So you can't possibly adjust that to make the vocals stronger or, or level with the guitars and drums. It's always right. going to be that way throughout. So if mm -hmm. you can live with that, 
it's still a fascinating recording to listen to in terms of listening to their playing. I mean, this is all we got, let's face it, <laughs> from the right. days in Hamburg. This is the only live recording that's ever, that's ever surfaced. Um, and uh, I think that we should treasure it for, for certain reasons. But I also know that um, it's a pretty rough listen for people who are used to, you know, perfect studio recordings. You know, and well, I, I think, well, sure. I think, I think the one thing about it is it's it, it, there are moments on it. I wouldn't I wouldn't say the whole tape is superb, uh, superb as you know with their performance, but there are some great moments on that tape. I mean, there's they are. I don't. It, it's hard to imagine why George Harrison was so down on that recording. Mm -hmm. It doesn't do. It doesn't. You know, it does nothing to damage their reputation. If anything, it only enhances it. I mean. Mm -hmm. You could compare that. I mean, everybody loves obviously the the Hollywood Bowl stuff, but for raw energy, the Hollywood Bowl is nothing next to this. You know. Plus, this is this is the only live tape we have of them, uh, with with the exception of some of the BBC things where they were in a studio and had some options. This is the only live recording we have of them without screaming all over it. Mm -hmm. you know, here they are playing an awful lot of stuff, including a lot of the songs that were otherwise available only on the BBC recordings, right. uh, playing them live in a room for people. I mean, that's as authentic as you can get for, you know, for how they were at that period, right before they catapulted into, um, as Candy Leonard might say, Beatleness. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> I mean, they had a single out. They had a second one recorded, but um, you know, "Love Me Do" got up to number seventeen. They weren't yet what we sort of knew that, and what we know them as now. Um, and here they are, just you know, playing, you know, letting it rip. And uh, it's you know, it's I think I think it's it's not a perfect performance. Um, there, there are some stray notes here and there, um, particularly, and maybe this is why George was particularly against it. I mean, some of the lead guitar solos are a little probably experimental and things work and don't work, uh, or go astray, but, mm. um, you know, but it, it kind of shows them working as a live band. It's not, you know, you get two takes of the song and they're not the same, you know, uh, when they played live on the live recordings, we know they tend to be very close to the record. Um, here, there are, you hear them trying things. I mean, for instance, I saw her standing there. Um, there are a couple of different takes of it, and Paul phrases it differently, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of... Uh, it, it's for, if you're a student of the band, as, as you, know, you might put it, uh, and you want to know how they did things and how the process... Uh, in which the songs as we know them from the studio recordings evolved, this is an incredible tape to hear. Mm -hmm. Now, the only other tape, the only other early recordings we have are that uh, Some Other Guy mm -hmm. in Kansas City from the Cavern, mm -hmm. and also that one little rehearsal, and I can't... Um, the Cavern sure. rehearsal, yeah. Yeah, that mm -hmm. one. Um, you know, those are the only other pre beatlemania tapes that we have outside of the BBC things. Mm -hmm. And um, but you're right. This is unique in that nobody is, you know. There's well, the the cavern rehearsal doesn't have any screaming on it either, actually. But but this no is a, audience. It's just them. Right, right. But this is but this is much better because there's more energy because you've got people yelling in the background and you know and and um, you know it's uh, the atmosphere of Hamburg is there and that was that was unique unto itself. Um, so I find yeah. these recordings to be very fascinating now. Once you, you know, if you really get into the history of the Beatles and how they evolved and what they were performing at a certain time, I always remember going back to when Mark Lewison put out his book, The Beatles Live, which um, was the first major book that he wrote on the Beatles. And it documented all the songs that they had done live up through 66. But was, what was really fascinating was the early years and the songs that they covered at that time. And whatever Mark could find, the group uh, performed even just once was there in the book. And you would have a list of all these song titles with the original artists or the artists who influenced the, the influential version that the Beatles heard. And, you know, I'd be salivating looking at this list and wishing that I could hear some of these recordings. 
And this is a good taste of it, live at the Star Club, <laughs> because in addition to the songs that the Beatles eventually released that they covered, like Mr. Moonlight or one of those songs, and the songs that they did on BBC Radio, which I treasure, you got a whole bunch of other songs that they never released. So mm -hmm. this was all part of their repertoire, you know, knowing the songs that they did live at that time, knowing mm -hmm. the songs that they covered, you know, and, and also I find it interesting, the whole process of when they finally had their record contract, what did they decide they would release on EMI Parlophone of the songs that they covered when they had so many of these other songs that they, that they did very well live in mm -hmm. concert? You know, part of the reason why they were able to record the Please Please Me album so quickly, 10 of the 14 songs in one day, is because they were songs that they, they knew so well. You know, many of them were covers that they were doing in concert all the time. So, right. but there are all these other songs, like the one that you just mentioned, Where Have You Been All My Life? That's mm -hmm. one of the real gems that you discover on this, on this uh, right. collection there. That's an right. Arthur Alexander song. Which, uh, you know, you hear this and you kind of wish, God, I wish there was a better version, you know, or, you know, a BBC version. You know, if you look at the, um, the 36 songs the Beatles did on BBC radio that they never released themselves, that's three albums worth of material that they could have released right there. And those are only those songs. And mm -hmm. then you've got all these other songs that they used to do live. So, right. um, and they really were, they were both a tight band at the Star Club and they were loose at the same time. But more importantly, they were real, and they were human. And like you said, Alan, there are some mistakes there. At the very beginning of Roll Over Beethoven, George is making a mistake on the guitar. Mm -hmm. So, But it's, it's left in there, and I find all that fascinating because it's real. Mm -hmm. you know? But um, there's a lot of gems there on, on uh, these recordings. Uh, especially, you know, Sheila is a nice treat. Mm -hmm. um, the Beatles did the, the Tommy Rowe song, and George sang lead on that. And as we learned from uh, Mark Lewison's book, um, Brian Epstein, once he became manager, he really wanted George to get more songs to sing. He thought that would make them even more attractive as a band to have three lead vocalists. So, um, you know, that's something that you notice, especially with the BBC recordings. And then you go to Life at the Star Club and you got a few more songs from George than you normally would get on a mm -hmm. studio Beatles album. Mm -hmm. but, when, um, one thing that you should... That should be mentioned about the Zoom Lot set is the fact that not all the tracks are the Beatles. They've managed to put out the uh, a King Size uh, King Size Taylor set. Right. Um, there's nine, nine nine tracks of King Size Taylor, and one of Cliff Rebel and the Rebel Rousers. And the I think the Rebel Rousers had been out. The Holly Gully. I think that's the one that mask that everybody that was masqueraded as the Beatles and isn't them. But right. the King's Hat Taylor stuff is brand, is brand new. Mm -hmm. And it was funny, because I was listening to that, how many of those songs were songs done by the Beatles and how closely the King Size Taylor versions re resembled what the Beatles did. And you wonder, who got it from who? You mm -hmm. Because the King Size Taylor has money, it has um, Dizzy Miss Lizzie, and it has Twist and Shout. Right. And the versions, I mean, the, the, the Twist and Shout especially is a song that you can't, do really differently. It's not one of the you know that opens itself up to variations. But you wonder who who heard it or who heard what, you know. And uh, I'm you know I'm sure that a lot of that went on in, in Liverpool too. You know, in the Cavern days with everybody playing the Cavern. But uh, right. yeah, that's uh, that's uh, that's interesting. But uh, also we should mention there's a couple of songs. Bebop Alula. It's really Fred Fasher who is the, the waiter at the Star Club. He's the one who sang lead on that. I, was he <laughs> Horace Fasher's brother? I believe so. Yeah, okay. Good. Alan, what, what were and, you going to say? No, I, was, uh, I wanted to add something to that, you know, because you got the two Fashers here. And also, mm -hmm. Horace Fasher is the one who sang lead on Hallelujah, I Love Her So. Right. But right. The, the Beatles are backing both of them up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. and that's another interesting aspect of, of you know, they're, they're in a bar, people are coming up and singing with them. And, uh, you know, in, in Mark's book, he talks about some concerts where people sang with them, too. And it's, that's just kind of fascinating, you know. Mm -hmm. um, another thing I find interesting about this set uh, is that there aren't an awful lot of originals. There's I saw her standing there and asked me why. I, I think that's it, isn't it? Is there any other Lennon-McCartney thing here? 
They don't do Love Me Do, which is right. you know, currently out as a single. They don't do Please Please Me, which they had recorded about a month before and were going to have to be playing a lot pretty soon. You know, they, they may have do... done the Mother Nights than, than the ones these were recorded. but uh, Right. Uh, they also yeah. did Matchbox. They did Till There Was You, which is interesting on its own. You know them doing that in a club like in a club like the Star Club, you know, in a place like Hamburg. Why is that? Because it, it, uh, it's a it's not really a rocker. Uh, I mean, I would think that would be strange that they would exhibit that side of themselves in a club like that. Well, I think yeah, it but has a, a certain semi Marlena Dietrich quality, you know. <laughs> you know. I didn't, you know, I didn't think about that. that yeah. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Um, like falling in love again as well. I mean, that was one of her songs. So, right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I think they may have sort of reached back for that side of themselves now and then because to to appeal to the uh, uh, you know certain part of the audience, drunk and sentimental. Let's say, yeah. It's but but there aren't that many like it. I mean, there's a taste of honey as well, mm. but but they are mostly rockers and. You know, and some funny things like your feet's too big and lend me your comb. You know, those are those are both there. I mean, those those aspects of of their act as well uh, is represented. So, yeah, yeah, they they were also into. I guess you'd you'd want to call it novelty rock. You know, right. like they they love the coasters kind of stuff. So this yeah. is similar in that vein. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, the Beatles wanted to have that broad appeal, and that's why they did songs like "Falling in Love Again." Or mm-hmm. till there was you, um, and they also did over the rainbow, right? Uh, live, but um, from what I understand, the version that they were influenced by was Gene Vincent's version, mm-hmm. although the whole world knows Judy Garland doing it, right? But um, they were probably more influenced by the rock versions, and, and in the same way, till there was you, they were influenced by Peggy Lee's version as opposed to the soundtrack of the Music Man. Mm-hmm. Another thing that I think is really interesting here is just. Um, some of the songs they really did much faster mm-hmm. than the versions that we're used to on the, the studio recordings. I mean, Roll Over Beethoven is lightning speed, <laughs> as is uh, Nothing Shaken But the Leaves on the Trees. And uh, it's almost like, you know, if the Ramones could do Roll Over Beethoven, it would be <laughs> kind of like uh, what the Beatles were mm-hmm. doing there. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mr. Moonlight I'm, is also much faster. I'm talking uh, about you. Talking about you also. Yeah. And especially, they were just so good. I mean, they were good at everything to me, but they were exceptionally great at doing Chuck Berry material. And one of the the highlights for me, apart from I'm talking about you, which I always loved the the BBC recording, but Little Queenie. Oh yeah, that really mm-hmm. rocks. And it's nice to see Paul do a do the lead vocal on a Chuck Berry song, which he did there. So, um, you know, there's so many great Chuck Berry songs. Sweet Little Sixteen, they did fantastic. The BBC recording of that is is really phenomenal. It's one of my favorites of the BBC recordings. But, you know, you can tell how, how they were just so, you know, natural at doing Chuck Berry stuff, uh, you know, no matter who sang lead. Right. Yeah. Right. And also um, some other highlights I wrote down here. Well, you mentioned Lemme Your Comb. I really love that version. Reminiscing. Is really mm-hmm. interesting. You know, it's George singing lead there for a Buddy Holly song. I'm going to sit right down and cry over you. Another one which they, which was phenomenal as a BBC recording. And I wish I could shimmy like my sister Kate. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> what do you think of that? That was That's an Olympic great. song. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. And Red Hot. Red Hot is is pretty hot too. Yeah. With an organ part. Except that organ part, as I recall, is not them. It's Isn't Larry Young, correct? right? Yeah, right from one of the other groups. But yeah, right. Yeah, that no, that is that is a great that is a great version. Um, but uh, I mean, o- overall, though, the you know the the question of you know whether they were wrong to reject this the way they did. I mean, I think that's I think that was a mistake. Uh, getting back to what we you know the topic we had a couple of weeks ago about mistakes. I mean, this is a a great set and um you know i hope at some point somebody in the beatles you know uh in the beatles family decides that you know this deserves to you know not to be shoveled away under a you know under a box and and actually give it a decent release um yeah 
Well, it's a never-ending debate. You know, we all want the Beatles to think the way the fans do. And they just don't. You know, they're very sensitive to their own works. And as I've said on this show a number of times, you know, often the Beatles themselves have referred to, or at least Paul has said it, and I think Ringo has said it, like the Beatles anthology material is scraping the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, uh, to us, it's fascinating. I don't know about the average person, but, um, you know, to me, anything that's unreleased and anything that shows the development of a song and the changes that are being made and how the Beatles evolved, you know, as a band and with their mm -hmm. music, to me, I find fascinating. You know, but we, you know, we expect them to think the way that we do. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of artists out there that don't mind releasing a lot of their unreleased stuff. The Beatles are not that way. And, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty mir miraculous that we got the Beatles anthology material. So um, we wish that they would see things the way that we do. And certainly in terms of historical perspective, this stuff is really important. We could go into a whole thing about the the worth of the anthology recordings because I think they, that was really a letdown, um, an incredible letdown. I mean, it's nice that we got some of those unreleased things, but um, the way it was handled and the way it was it was done was was pretty bad. And, I mean, they were there was a lot of uh, Alan. You probably know better than I do, but there was a lot of messing around, and they 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 held. There were delays, and I think they actually they actually reprinted. They had a finished version, and they called it back because yeah. I actually saw I actually saw the book the booklet for it, and then I think that was number three actually that they called back. And it was, I mean that's, that's kind of that was crazy stuff. I mean that shouldn't have happened. Shouldn't have happened like that, especially for a project like that. I remember them calling back number two because something was taken out of chronological order. And, and is that they, what is it? Is that the one? Okay, they, I can't. Yeah, remember. they. I think they just wanted it restored to chronological order, or or vice versa. Maybe it had been in chronological order, and they thought that something mm -hmm. would be better at the top. Yeah, it, it wasn't like to, I don't think it was to change anything or delete anything. I think it was just a positioning question. Okay. I like the anthology, you know. It's um, I, I understand what you're saying. I mean, things were definitely edited and tinkered with, um, but I think um, you can have expected them to do that because, as Ken said, they're they're very sensitive about their work. You know, I I actually uh, in one of the interviews I did with Paul McCartney, he talked about this whole question of unreleased stuff and it was um, before the anthology came out it was around 1990 and he said you know I understand why you find this fascinating I mean and he said I bootleg other people's stuff which I guess <laughs> by which he meant he goes to concerts with a tape recorder <laughs> um, <laughs> and, um, and that's a great said, quote he said, but you have to understand that you know I'm the guy who you know you have what you think is a great photo of, but I look at it and I say, you know, my nose looks too big in that picture. And when it's us doing it, I, I, we're just very careful about what gets out there because we let an unreleased take of, you know, I think we talked at the time about the version of Can't Buy Me Love with the call and response um, intro, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, which was not out yet because the anthology wasn't out yet, but it had been bootlegged. And what McCartney said was that uh, if, a, if a kid hears, say, the outtake of Can't Buy Me Love on the radio and doesn't know that it's the outtake, he felt that there'd be no way to know what was the finished product and what was the interesting oddity. Uh, and I said, well, you know, there'd be liner notes, things like that. So it would all be explained. And he said, yeah, but, you know, people don't read the liner notes on the radio. They just play the track. And if you're just coming to the Beatles fresh, and this is the version of Can't Buy Me Love You Here, you're going to think that this is the real version. And it's important to us that our finished work be heard. Um, they obviously got over that um, to put the things out in the anthology, but I think that's also why some of these tracks were edited in ways that that you feel they shouldn't have been. I mean, they're kind of making a compromise with us here as fans. They're going to give us something unusual, but they're not going to – they're not going to give us the 
you know, bad notes and the, you know, bad ideas and they're, they're going to put things together. So I think that version of Can't Buy Me Love is edited and they're, uh, you know, they made a version of One After 909 that brings together several takes, but that's what they would have done if they released that at the time. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't so much the editing. I mean, I, you know, the editing, I, I actually understand that. Mm-hmm. But it was the way it was the disorganization and the way the you know they they put out the three separate sets um, you know and there was a long delay between them and and all that and that just that just didn't make sense to me yeah. I think well, going back you know, going back going back to that you know I mean it, you know now it would have been completely different you know they would have put out a six CD set they would have put out vinyl they would have put out God knows what I mean it would have been immense you know the the probably the one good thing about when it came out is it came out reasonably priced because if it came out now it would be incredibly expensive <laughs> well right you know i mean even at the time there were some collectors labels who put out especially in jazz you know who put out 10 disc sets of someone's you know, mm-hmm. outtakes and i think the beatles and emi were a bit more conservative than that and they felt that you know people will buy a two disc set and they may buy another one in four months but they're not going to be happy buying a six disc set um and whether they're right or wrong i mean you know i think all of us would have gone and bought it no matter how many discs it was but that was their thinking i think uh they and wanted looked, to look- not not only yeah. that, but if you release them separately they're, and they're months apart, it becomes more of an, of an event each time you do that. So there's more buildup. Well, especially know, got with the, the first, first two because of, of Free as a Bird and, and Real Love. Right. You know, people are anticipating these things. Yeah, right. So. And look, look what happened, though, with the boot, like with the, uh, with the, with the iTunes release. Mm. They, people went nuts over that. I mean, they went absolutely crazy. Yeah. And the anticipation that there wasn't one last year is, it, you know, I you still I still occasionally hear people saying, why didn't they put one out last year? Uh, even though there had been indications, and you probably heard them too, Alan, that they weren't going to do it. You know, right. there were, I, and I heard that all year. I didn't really want to believe it, but I but the indications I kept getting, and the indi- and what I kept you know, trying to tell people was, you may not get it, and nobody would believe it. And, and there were even people writing that you would get it. And mm-hmm. as it turned out, it didn't happen, you know. And, you know, so that's, you know, um, I mean, I still would like to see them do it. And maybe they'll reverse course. But, you know, I think they probably set the bar last year. I think that's going to... I think that's going to do it for whatever reason. I would love to know. I'll tell you. Yeah. I mean, I think they're going to do what they want to do when they want to do it, and they're going to take their time. I mean, it would have made sense for 1964, given the hoopla that they tried to avoid because they didn't want people to think it was 50 years. That would have been the time to put out some really deluxe editions of, say, you know, with the Beatles and Please Please Me with as many outtakes as you could get and, you know, different mixes and things. And uh, and it would have been logical. Any other band would have done it, and they didn't. And, you know, they don't have to. They can do what they want. And I'm hoping that eventually they'll want to. But, you know, there are other projects still clogging up the pipeline that they're also taking their time with. I mean, way before the anthology was released, they had remastered the Shea Stadium concert for a video disc release, and it hasn't come out. Same with Let It Be. You know, Let It Be has been kicking around to Apple for a really long time. I mean, they they did interviews with Neil and with everybody Mm -hmm. else that are are there uh, waiting to be heard, and uh, there's there's been talk of perhaps offering a different edit that shows them a bit happier, you know, in addition to the regular film. There are all kinds of ideas, and maybe because there are so many ideas, it's getting held up too. But Let It Be had originally been remastered for release before the anthology came out. So they've got these projects. They're just sort of not getting them out there. And when they do, I mean, I I can understand what you're saying about the anthology being disappointing, because when they finally put out Let It Be Naked, 
I was hoping that they would put out one of the Glenn's Johns mixes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Johns. I was too. I you was know, too. because because that you know that actually is quite good. I know they didn't like it at the time, um, or at least Paul didn't like it at the time. I think John did, but you know that kind of was the album that almost was, and mm-hmm. I was kind of disappointed. I let it be naked. I, I I reviewed it for the Times at the time, and I think in the end I said it really was let it be with a fig leaf. So. <laughs> you know, I I kind of felt that way too when it first came out, but I've changed I've changed my tune mm. to to use a pun um, <laughs> because I because it sounds so so damn good. I mean, the sound quality, the the remastering on it sound, just sounds so great that it really kind of ease my fears about it. Um, I wish all the al- their albums sounded as nice as that one does. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, yeah, no, I agree with you. I wish they had put out the Get Back album. And uh, um, I also wish they had done a little more with the outtakes uh, that they captured from the bootleggers. Uh, I wish they had, you know, not just put that little excerpt on the on the extra disc or had done something a little different there maybe mm-hmm. add a little more to that extra disc but what can you say this is more of a continuation of the beatles mistakes there we go so we really we really, we, today. we really yeah, got we really got off on that it's yeah. supposed to be about the star club here but right <laughs> and it all, all proceeds from the idea that they made a mistake in not releasing the star club tapes officially which uh yeah i really do hope they reconsider too um maybe someone should send uh danny harrison a copy of this uh latest version and uh see if he thinks better of it than his father did i i doubt yes, he that? would want to countermand his father's uh decisions but still you know, even, not even so, maybe Danny not, Harrison. Maybe not, maybe not so soon. Maybe not so soon, but maybe, uh, you know, a few years down the road, uh, he might reconsider that. Mm-hmm. I remember but, before we expanded our show to have uh, Alan, Alan, we were talking about Danny Harrison and, and the disappointment that we, we didn't get more material out of the the Apple box the George mm-hmm. Harrison Apple box and and Danny was saying he didn't he wants to take his time with all the early take stuff he he doesn't want to be again scraping the bottom of the barrel so he's going to be respectful of his father's feelings mm-hmm. and so you know this is a never ending issue between the fans who want everything or the best of what's unreleased and the Beatles and their and their families and how they're going to handle this well so, I, yeah. uh, I think we all understand that, but I think that there's one other point to mention, which is that um, a lot of us who really want to hear this stuff are people who grew up hearing them, and by the time they release them, the audience is going to be people who first heard about the Beatles when Paul recorded with Kanye. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, it's like well, a, their audience is like, we're getting older. <laughs> Well, right. Do you think? Do you think? Well, this is going to start a whole other conversation. <laughs> but do you, you know, but just we can save this for another show. But maybe we should just bring this up: whether or not you think young fans of today can get so passionately interested in the, in the Beatles that they would get interested in all the bootlegs too, you know? Or is that strictly more of a first generation or second generation thing? Do you have to live through it in order to want to get that passionate into everything that they've ever done? I don't think you know, so. so. Oh, I'm I don't surprised so. at how, you know, John Wynn, who's put out um, quite a number of books about their their session recordings and et cetera, you know, uh, chronologies that include everything they did. And he's a, a fantastic researcher. And I mean, I can't remember exactly how old he, he is, but I was startled to learn how young it is. It's like, he's, I think he's in his thirties now. And is he really? Yeah. And he's been doing this for quite a while. Um, he may be hurtling towards 40. I don't know. But, but I remember, uh, you know, years ago hearing how young he was and I was really astonished. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, and, and listen, you know, there are people who get into jazz now and will collect, I mean, who's buying these complete works of Django Reinhardt things? I mean, I don't, Mm -hmm. hardly any of his audience is alive, if any, um, you know, those things were recorded in the forties and yet you see 
uh, Mosaic and other jazz labels putting out, you know, 10, 12 disc sets of Django Reinhardt or, you know, okay, B.B. King, you know, okay, you just died and people, you know, remember a lot of things, but you see, you know, complete works uh, and complete 40s and 50s recordings of B.B. King coming out now, and, uh, and and they were coming out when he was alive. So I, mean, I, 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 love, I love Reinhardt, too. I, I, I want to mention that. I, I'm a big fan of uh, Django Reinhardt. Mm-hmm. Hmm. There's a couple things I want to just bring up about the Star Club that we didn't get to. There's a few songs that the Beatles performed that are not complete on these recordings, and I don't know whether that was a case of whether or not the reel-to-reel machine was started late or whether the tapes didn't survive that well. But um, I Remember You, which is the Frank Ifield song that was a hit in 62. That's not complete, the Beatles' performance of that. And also Nothing Shaken But the Leaves on the Trees is not complete as well. So that's a slight disappointment. It's, <laughs> and, you know, and Red I, Hot and Sheila end early. It could be that, that someone turned the tape recorder off or mm-hmm. reel ran out. Yeah. Alan, you would know this probably better than I would. The Zoomlaut recordings are more than one night, is that correct? Right. Um, it's at least December 25th and December 28th. I think there's been some debate about whether there was New Year's Eve as well. Um, I think mm-hmm. the current feeling is that, that it's not, but um, because there's the people who speak German have been parsing some of the stuff that's been said uh, that indicates the New Year or New Year's Eve, and and are thinking mm-hmm. that you know it's 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 not said in the way that that it would have been if if it really was. So, okay. uh, yeah, it's at least two nights. Wouldn't the Beatles have have said something on stage about it being New Year's Eve or Happy New Year or anything? You would was? think, yeah, yeah, you would think, yeah, you would you would think you would think so, although. You know, given Lennon, well, I don't know. No, I would, uh, yeah, I suppose he, he would. Although, you know, John was so crazy. I mean, as far as, you know, getting up there on stage, and God knows what they might have been on at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so they may not have been thinking along those lines. But Or the tape recorder could have been off when they said it, if they said it. So. True. That's true, too. But how do we know it was those two dates? Is it on the tape box? Um, it may be. I think so. Uh, that I, I don't there, really know. There is. I, there's got to be documentation because the the New Year's. I mean, I think Ted Taylor has said when it was recorded. So yeah. again, he was the one that he, you know. So uh, and he would know. And so. I guess I should mention again Hans Olaf Gottfredson's article due in uh, Record Collector magazine anytime soon. We'll we'll probably get to all those details and right. the track order. And that book, his book is is fantastic. If you can, yeah. it, I, I think it's it's it probably if you look it up to try and buy it, it's going to cost you a few bucks, but it's well worth it. Oops. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to repeat something that Alan said before, which I was going to bring up too, which I found rather interesting, in the fact that they didn't do "Love Me Do" live. When you consider the fact that that was their first official single on a major, you know, record company you would think that they would be all over that song. Right. And um, even though Please Please Me was recorded in November, they could have played that. I could understand not playing it if it wasn't released, but certainly Love Me Do. I found that a little bit baffling. You know, you're there to promote your work in part. And also, it's just a fascinating time to listen to the Beatles do this because they were on the brink of, you know, world stardom. And, yeah. uh, you know, if if you were to compare... January 1st of 62, when they had the Deco audition, when it was a year of uncertainty. And then at the end of the year was uh, a year of promise. (laughs) Right. You know, um, so much happened in 1962. And um, I know Mark Lewison has written that the Beatles didn't want to do this. They didn't want to go back to to Hamburg because they had so much going for them at that moment. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if I detect that in these in these recordings. I think that they're having a good time. You know, yeah, I also, yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I also, also think, think that they're they're not. You know, I I don't really think they saw it as promoting a promoting time. You know, if they were giving a concert, they'd have played "Love Me Do," but because that's to the audience that would go buy the record. But I think I think when they were in Hamburg, they were like in a different mindset. You know, it's like okay, here we're the band in this place. You know, and I don't think they I don't think they were thinking promotionally 
very much. Right. Right. And I also I also think that when you when you take into account that both John and George have said publicly that they were at their best as a live band when they were in Hamburg. Mm-hmm. For that reason alone, even though these are not great sounding recordings, they should be released for that reason. I think the Beatles were such a good band live that they could have done a lot of these songs in their sleep because, you know, they did eight hours a night minus the breaks. But still, you add that up night after night and you can tell how good they were at these songs that they could just wing it, you know. And I love hearing a lot of the especially a lot of George's guitar work here. You know, some of the solos that he did that uh, were a little bit uncharacteristic of him. That uh, if you're so used to the studio recordings that the Beatles made, and here he's he's much looser, and he's doing a lot of the the 50s rock and roll and, and early 60s rock and roll that they loved, and you know he's 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 uh, you know cutting it loose a little bit, and I enjoy hearing that in particular. So uh, it's a lot of reasons to to uh, enjoy this collection. You were talking before about them being rockers mainly, and they also did to know her is to love her. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, you know, another ballad there. So, you know, for the most part, rockers. But uh, and that's one of my all-time favorite BBC recordings right there. Mm-hmm. So uh, they did mix it up a bit. I was, I was looking at Spencer Lee's book, The Beatles in Hamburg, and he makes a point of which, be- which drummer played the most on stage with the Beatles. Was it Ringo or Pete Best? And, it, it, and the, the, you know, the, t- the Ted Taylor tapes have Ringo on them, but it was Pete Best who played with them in Hamburg more, which is kind of a, a, an interesting, no, I know, I know he was with them at the time. I'm just saying that in all the Hamburg gigs, uh, Pete Best was the one, you know, that they played with more. Hmm. So. Be interesting to hear also... some of those. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it would be, it would be. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like we have any, but uh, yeah. So. But also before we found out that this was done, at the end of 1962, when we knew for a fact that Ringo was in the band, didn't um, Alan Williams or maybe um, uh, Taylor, King Size Taylor, didn't they want to try to make it seem like it was when Pete was in the band? Because that way, then EMI wouldn't have the rights to these recordings and they couldn't protest it or the Beatles couldn't protest it. Wasn't there a, a period there when, when they were trying to establish these recordings maybe as being pre-Ringo? I don't remember that. Do you, Alan? I, se- I seem to remember hearing about that. I don't remember that either. Well, uh, I, know, I know there was the whole rumble about whether or not they were signed to EMI at the time, and I think it had more to do with the date they were recorded, I think, Alan. Yeah, uh, that's I think, pretty clear. Right. Uh, I think, you know, Ken, maybe what you're thinking of is – uh, you may remember, I mean, only a few years after these came out, uh, there was a sort of gray market version or several versions of the Decca audition tape that Pete Best was actually promoting. I mean, they made mm-hmm. picture discs with Pete Best's you know, picture on it and, and right, he I gave have interviews. It. Yeah. So maybe maybe you're thinking of that or or something. Mm. No, I thought that maybe this was this was done deliberately so that EMI couldn't contest He's coming out. If they could say, if they could prove, or if they could say Pete Best was the drummer, then Mm -hmm. you knew that that was done before the Beatles had a record contract. Right. Yeah, they may have tried to obscure that when the when the Linga song version came out in '77. I I don't remember. I'd have to pull the disc out and see if it says Ringo. Or haven't looked lately. Mm -hmm. Mainly been listening to the online versions, you know. Okay. Anyway. All right, so uh, that puts this show to a close. This has been great talking about the Star Club, although we did quite a lot about uh, <laughs> the Beatles. Few other things. Few okay, other things. But, but uh, that's just to tease everybody for future shows that we're going to do. That's why we mm-hmm. did that. It was all yeah. done deliberately, folks. <laughs> so if any of you would like to, and we make it to sound so smooth that you wouldn't even know it, but believe mm-hmm. me, it's all done deliberately, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> If any of you would like to write to us, we have an email address here, which is things we said today radio show at gmail dot com We also have a Facebook page for our show called Things We Said Today. Each of us has our own Facebook page. mine is under Ken Michaels. Alan has uh a couple two actually. of them yeah Alan Cozen and Alan Cozen remixed <laughs> and uh Steve has about uh three thousand of them something but, like uh, that. You could just mention a couple. 
Well, I have the one, my personal one, and I have a, a a Beatle News one, Beatle News and Commentary, and then of course we have Facebook pages for the radio show too. So we're there. Oh, um, and, Al, and Al Sussman can be found on Facebook. And Al Sus- right, Al Sussman's definitely on Facebook. Okay, and uh, also I just want to make a quick mention of my website. KenMichaelsRadio.com. There's a brand new interview on my website that I just did with Gary Burr, who uh, many of you will know for all of his work with Ringo. He was a member of the Roundheads. He started work with Ringo on the Ringo Rama album, and he's still working with him today, even on the new album on Postcards from Paradise. There's a song that they wrote together, Touch and Go. And it's all about, um, you know, working with Ringo and his whole history in uh, the country and pop field. He's had an incredible career as a songwriter. He's like a brill building writer in a way. <laughs> um, and I think you'll find uh, this conversation very fascinating. It's on my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com. All right? So, thanks so much for joining us. And for things we said today, I'm Ken Michaels, being joined by Steve Marinucci and Alan Cozen, saying thanks for listening, and we will see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>